year, we moved in to this building as soon as I graduated, May 2021. Uh, we were here for probably eight months, and then after that, we ran out of money temporarily, and we moved back home, and then we raised a little bit more money, and we came back. <laughs> so we were there, here, I guess, a total of two years, and it's just great to be back. Uh, the reason for this presentation is me and my co-founder, Anshul, spent a couple hours last week just talking about everything that we messed up over the last five years that we've been working on this. And I think a lot of these mistakes are made by most pre-seed startups. We might have some unique ones in there that you could definitely avoid. But uh, the goal is to have an honest reflection and discussion on these mistakes. And I know there's a lot of founders out there, and I really hope you can talk about these different topics and see if you have a different flavor of some of these mistakes. And the gist is there's a lot of resources around here to tell you what to do right. So I'm just gonna be here and be an example of uh, what not to do. Because uh, we'll, we can point you towards uh, different resources on the different techniques and things you should do. So uh, I'm the CEO of DeepLock. Essentially what we do is we make a machine learning platform where city engineers put in 3D models from drones, phones, uh, satellite, car mounted LiDAR systems, all kinds of stuff. Of uh, 3D models of infrastructure, we use machine learning to automatically measure them. And then we create all these maps, designs, reports, and different things that cities need to go and fix their infrastructure. Right now we focus on automating sidewalk accessibility inspections, so cities use LiDAR standards on iPhones, go scan their sidewalk, and we tell them what's accessible, what's not accessible, give them all the legally required documents, and then give them construction documents they need every year to go and you know, fix their sidewalks. Uh, as others mentioned, we've founded DeepLock technically in 2018 when I was a freshman, and then we participated in, I would say most UIUC entrepreneurship programs, and then uh, also pretended to be in Chicago students there for a little bit, but does as well. Uh, we're, I guess technically we're edging up on $2 million in seed funding at the moment. Uh, we've been sort of tagging on some angles there at the end. But you can see a couple different pictures. We started in 54, the startup competition with founders. We did COZAD, we did iVenture. If, if there was a program back there, you know, back then, we did it. And uh, like I mentioned, the goal is just to have an honest discussion of common mistakes. I want to touch on three things that I think we did pretty well. Uh, and then I want to walk through the list of mistakes. And the goal is to have a, an actual discussion. I know there's some founders out there. Please tack on whatever you want. Whenever we walk through some of these mistakes that maybe you did or didn't make, it would be really helpful to have insights that are not mine to go and discuss. And, uh, I think there's an opportunity for a lot of learning here. So uh, I'll just sort of jump into some disclaimers as well. Uh, there's definitely a little bit of software bias in here. We're a software company, and there's a couple software-related things and bias to some of these mistakes. But I think most of them are generally applicable to whatever you're doing. There's also a good side to most of these mistakes where we learned something or made a connection. So there's definitely a good side to most of them. And then I also don't have a solution to almost all of them. So <laughs> I'm really counting on your, uh, your insight and I'll throw what we think the solution is. But uh, a lot of these are really hard and we still struggle with some of them today. Uh, so win number one, we're solving a really good problem. And that's because we did the i program here and you learned the process of customer discovery. And making sure you're solving a real and big problem helps you get away with a lot of mistakes. And then when times are tough, it's, uh, it really provides motivation to get through. Because you really feel, you know, when you're talking to your customers, even though you're having issues, when you're actually solving a real problem, it feels good. It helps you get through those tough times. As far as a resource, there's the i program. And I love the Startup Owner's Manual book. It tells you step by step on how to do the customer discovery. And then it also tells you how to stop doing customer discovery and go actually build stuff. So I think most people just read the first couple of chapters, but if you follow it all the way through, I'm pretty sure given an infinite amount of time, you will make a successful startup company. <laughs> so uh, highly recommend that book. Next thing, have a great co-founder. Uh, y Combinator recommends teams of two to three for a reason. 
And it really keeps you honest throughout the startup process, be it technical development or uh, any sort of business thing. Having another person uh, working on those with you really keeps you honest and balances things out. And I got lucky. My co-founder is amazing. I love that guy. <laughs> and it really makes it fun uh, to go to work every day and hack on really hard problems with uh, someone that you think is really good. I think for a pre-seed company, two to three people that really care about the problem and really care about the company is where you want to be. Uh, it's a blast. His name's Amshul Shah. He's, he's a genius and uh, appreciate that guy. And there's another book that we learned about you know, communication with co-founders and just teams in general called The Culture Code. And we both read it and it really changed the way that we communicate and how we built our team and it's an amazing book. I've read it two or three times now, right now, and uh, highly recommend. And then uh, another thing that I think a lot of people tend to forget, especially in pre-seed, is to actually build the product. Uh, it seems like a lot, of, a lot of times you get stuck in maybe an infinite customer discovery cycle, and you never actually get to the part where you build it, or you get stuck in you know constantly doing pitch competitions, and at some point you do have to build a product, and we did a couple good things where we challenged how minimal an MVP could be. Uh, and then we also got the MVP in front of customers really quickly, and that made things real. And having one and a half technical co-founders is pretty nice because I, I was technical enough to actually be able to make some contributions. And then uh, I guess I'll call it the truth serum. Whenever you ask customers for money for something, they will tell you the truth. Whenever you tell them about your solution, they will tell you nice things. They will tell you it's the greatest thing in the world. But until you ask them for money, they will just lie to your face, honestly. Uh, I've never met a customer where we were talking, or a potential customer where we were talking about our solution, and they're like, wow, that's the worst idea I've ever heard in my entire life. Or given any sort of helpful feedback. But if you ask them for even $10, or $100, or thousands of dollars, they'll immediately tell you everything that's wrong with your product. So the earlier you can ask for money, the more truth you're gonna get, and the faster you're gonna converge on a good product. Uh, so those are the three things I think we did pretty well. And there's a lot of resources around here. Uh, you know, good books on, the Lean Startup has some good techniques on how to make really, really minimal MVPs, and how to use a PowerPoint presentation to get some truth out of your customers before you have any working code. And then the Lean Product Playbook has some other really good uh, resources on just how to do agile development, pair it with customer discovery, and different things like that. Um, so yeah, did three good things. Now I'm gonna dive into the things we really messed up. Uh, when we're starting out, we were bouncing between four different lawyers because we had no money and we were just following resor free resources all over the place. And one, we missed an 83B election. If you don't know what an 83B election is, uh, I made $19,000 last year in salary, and I have a $4,000 tax bill because I messed up my 83B. So whenever you do an incorporation, even though you don't really know what an 83B is, check with your lawyer and make sure you did it. Because uh, otherwise you'll have a major tax issue, and yeah, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> another problem we had is as we're bouncing between lawyers, the, the lawyers were unfamiliar with the documentation that we already had. So none of it actually flows. Right now we have a patchwork of legal templates from four different lawyers, and none of it's very coherent, and it's been very expensive to go back and make sure it all kind of connects. So uh, talking about not having a solution, you're kind of forced into this when you have no money, and you're just gonna go around and take free resources, but just be aware that these are the problems that can happen, and Try to address them. Make sure you ask for an 83B. Whenever you do have some money, ask for your current legal counsel to maybe just skim over your existing. And uh, let's probably go into unnecessarily bootstrapping legal work. There was a time when we raised two to three hundred thousand dollars, and we actually had a little money to go and fix our legal documents. And uh, we just did other things. <laughs> so. We didn't thoroughly understand everything that was going in our legal docs, and we didn't have the money to go and ask the lawyers when we had them, you know, what does all this mean? 
there's free resources out there and advisors that you can go through your legal docs, especially through the university, and just walk through your legal documents and ask them questions on things that don't make sense. We have an like 80% acceleration thing where it's, you know, we sell the company, we don't even get all of our shares. So I kind of want my shares if we sold the company tomorrow. <laughs> so uh, just little things like that we didn't really know. So before you sign anything, go and try to bounce, bounce it off the smart people in the community. Uh, so we also didn't do a legal review before our seed fundraise. We had a couple hundred thousand dollars, like two, three hundred thousand dollars, and we could have spent five thousand dollars to go to a lawyer and be like, hey, can you do due diligence on us before we start fundraising to make sure we don't have any things to be fixed? So uh, we get our lead investor, they're excited, and uh, they ask for our legal, legal documents and their uh, discombobulated mess. And that was probably the most stressful three weeks of my entire life uh, trying to get all that through. And uh, to make it even more stressful, um, I didn't hand off the due diligence process to our lawyers. Uh, they asked, our investors asked for a list of you know, documents and questions, and I just tried to answer them all ourselves because I'm used to bootstrapping things, so I was just trying to stick everything together. And then our investor actually shot me an email, and he said, hey, just let your lawyers take care of us. The bulk of our lives will be way easier. So whenever you are and have an interested investor and you're going through legal diligence and you have more than $10,000 to your name, just have, have your lawyer take care of it. <laughs> because it was, it was horribly stressful to go and try to handle kind of that by ourselves. And then I just emailed my lawyer and said, hey, I need help, can you just take care of this? And they did, and it took you know, two days for them to fix it. So highly recommend doing that if you have the resources to. Uh, another thing we did wrong is we had a non-standard vesting schedule. So the standard vesting schedule is four years. You invest your shares over four years, and if you leave before one year, you lose all your shares. That's sort of the standard. There's also a two-year cliff, so if you leave before two years. Those are, uh, that's the standard way to do things for a reason. Uh, and we tried to put a bunch of value on previous work that we did as students and just did a really weird vesting schedule. And we just had to go and fix it. And it's really awkward to get shares back after you gave them to people and then they leave. And you just don't want to be in that position. I think the, the best way for a student to start up or someone in academia to set up a vesting schedule is to set the cliff one year after you go full time. Because the amount of risk you're taking while you're in school or while you're a grad student or while you're a professor is effectively zero. Um, controversial opinion, but compared to quitting your job and going full time, the risk is pretty much zero. It might even be negative risk where you're getting benefits by having this on your resume. So the amount of risk is light years differently. And then we also underestimated the amount of value you provide when you, the difference of value between five hours a week or 10 hours a week versus you know, 40, 50, 60 hours a week, huge difference. So you might get some disagreement. I think you should start your vesting schedule after you go full time. After you graduate, after you turn down your you know, $150,000 a year Facebook whatever offer, after you make those risks, I think that's when vesting should start. And then when you get other people involved, you can do smaller stock option grants to keep them motivated to work as advisors or part-time people. But we put way too much value on the weekend, occasional weekend hackathon that we did during school versus quitting your job and working in there and trying to make everything work. So uh, yeah, I highly recommend starting vesting after you go full time. So these were kind of the administrative legal mistakes we made. Does anybody have any, uh, any comparable legal mistakes that maybe I missed, or did they possibly make any of these mistakes? I could be alone, and everybody else is perfect, so I'm not sure. Everybody else nailed it? You have a single lawyer, and they took care of everything, and you have a perfect vesting schedule? Wow. There we go. How's it going, Laura? Yes. So I had an attorney who didn't know what to do with us, and we had a 50-50 ownership.
membership and no vesting, and in the end it worked. We did have a buy-sell agreement, and in the end it worked out well for me, is that I paid for one piece to get, you don't know what that means, very little to get out of my company, which is now has a very high valuation. So that was also me before a lot of that high valuation was developed, so I don't feel that way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, two, two things that come to my mind. Uh, one is the legal documents. Yes. Uh, I, was, I was talking about, for those that don't know, I, my name is Jed Taylor. I run the Technology Entrepreneur Center. We work with lots of uh, student teams and faculty teams. And it just comes to my mind, we had a, a, backer, a, a former student entrepreneur on campus last year that was talking. She sold her company for hundreds of millions of dollars. And she was talking to teams, the students last year, she gave an example of the same thing, signing legal documents, didn't read the terms, and she talked about how she had a deal that tanked. She had her company ready to sell to Amazon for 30 or $40 million, and it ended up falling through at the last minute because of a deal, or because she used a cheap lawyer for the founding documents, and there was one sentence in there that any respectable lawyer would have struck out, but she didn't think about it, didn't read the documents, and she said she couldn't get out of bed for months after that deal tanked. So her, 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 her statement to all the students were, don't go cheap on lawyers and read all the documents, just like you said. So I, I can't tell you enough about that. Like, just, you were correct. You're not the only one, Brandon. But you better have a $30 million deal tanked. Yeah. Now, not yet. <laughs> not yet. Hopefully, you have that chance. Yeah. Uh, so that was one thing. The second thing that came to my mind was vesting schedules, and and getting your founders and your vesting schedules all worked out. That's something we see all the time at the university, especially with student startups. And there are two different ways: one with your co-founders, and then one with faculty uh, members as well. So making sure you get those things right. And I think the other point you made is very well taken about. Just do, there, there are standard best practices for these, and they're there for a reason. And I think you said something really, really good there. I've seen that in a startup I was involved with, and seen it over and over again. There's, you know, get some expertise around, talk to your other people around there, and follow best practices. They're there for a reason. <coughs> Every single time that we're, like, our lawyer presented us with a standard way to do something, and we thought, oh, we're special, yeah. we're in this special situation that they don't know what we're talking about, so we're going to ask them to do the special thing because we're in this special situation. Every single time, we had to pay money later to go and fix it, and it was always because somebody, there was a problem. That, it was just a nightmare. So, uh, yeah, do things the normal way if you can. Okay, yep. this is uh, uh, the book going through uh, starting the uh, business plan. But, uh, you know, when uh, we look for investors, uh, so investors, they, they do uh, due diligence with us. So it says potential, no, how many days, how So one thing that I've learned that also is very important to check it out the investors. Okay, if you have an investor, ah, may I know with some of your uh, uh, companies that you invest on? And usually people, when you talk, and if they are, sometimes they answer your phone because they, well, they have to, but they are all the, are big bigger. And so you can, you can read in between lines how exciting is this problem with this investor. So that is, I think, very useful uh, to, to check it out. And also, <coughs> uh, uh, sometimes, you know, they are, in general, uh, ranges. Okay, for a set, if they look for the investment, okay. About 20%, but some investment is going to see 50%. And said, what is that? You want to hear me? 50%. And he said, okay, because, and if they start doing this, I think this is red flags. So that is what I'm learning uh, about ownership. Definitely. And just uh, for the microphone, if I'm understanding uh, correctly, the, it's a red flag if your investor does not want to share their portfolio companies with you and those portfolio companies aren't excited and recommending companies. And then also, if, they're, if the investors are trying to do something non-standard, it should also be a, a red flag to yourself, and you might want to bounce it off your advisors uh, to make sure it's not horribly non-standard. Uh, 
I think those are both really good points. <laughs> some good feedback and if you mention the solution people will just be really nice to you because no one wants to be mean to someone that's really excited about what they're working on so uh, it's good here customer discovery um, we got stuck in an infinite customer discovery loop and this book actually has these stop times where once you hit diminishing returns you move to the next step of customer validation customer creation company building uh, we just didn't follow that stop sign for a really long time and we were just doing did over 100 customer discovery interviews and we hit diminishing returns after 20 to 30. So uh, you can just kind of move on and actually start building some MVPs and testing those on your customers. So there is a stop time actually on those. Uh, another thing that happened is we were uh, constantly distracted by pitch competitions. This is one of those where it's a necessary evil because you need the money and the resources and the, and the contacts and the experience. But it is really distracting to stop doing everything and focus on perfecting a pitch. And I kind of felt like we were polishing a turd at some point, which is, uh, you know, we didn't spend much time improving the company. We spent a ton of time trying to present it in the most optimal way. And I think we had diminishing returns on that as well. But the other side of the coin is you need the money and the resources and the experience. So just be aware that this is something you're gonna have to kind of struggle through. And another thing we did that my technical co-founder uh, just recently told me that he temporarily hated me for was uh, using demo day as a technical deadline. You know, we have to get this demo or technology thing done by demo day or no one's gonna invest. And frankly, the best pitches I've seen are just PowerPoint presentation mock-ups and no one actually sort of cares about the technology for pre-seed other than the fact that they believe that you can build it and have made some progress. Demo day as a technical deadline is uh, a way to make your technical co-founder temporarily hate you for sure. Uh, another thing we still do is we neglect our website. Every time we run into an interesting company, we go and look at their website for information and I am horrified at the idea that come, people are hearing about our company and they go and looking at our website and it's not very good. It's, it's improving and we just hired someone to make stuff look good, but uh, keep it simple and have a good website that explains what you do. Uh, it's really important. It's not a huge amount of time, but it's a huge amount of value and it's just a red flag every time someone looks at your website and they think, wow, I'm gonna trust these guys to automatically measure stuff using fancy machine learning, and they can't even make a website. This is embarrassing. <laughs> so we still struggle with that. Uh, don't go to our website. Uh, another thing that uh, we struggled with was uh, we didn't know how to make a web app in the very beginning. We were more doing different tech things, so we hired a contractor through Upwork to do that, and I think that was a pretty big mistake. So in order to get something that resembled something that we wanted, we wanted we had to put a huge amount of work into the scope document and managing the scope while working with them. And then we didn't have the ex expertise to even know if they were doing a good job. And then once we had it, we couldn't make any changes to it because we didn't build it, we didn't have any expertise. So if I could go back in time with the probably 100 hours that we put into managing this project and playing around with it, 
if we could just go back and learn how to make a simple web app, and even if it was bad, we would know how it works and we can make improvements over time and different things like that. So just be really cautious about using contractors because it may seem like a shortcut, but I, don't, I just, I don't think it was. I think it, I think it actually took longer and we've had to replace every single piece of code that was in there. And later on, we just had to learn how to make web apps and we are completely throwing away the old one and building a new one right now. So that's just something to consider just using contractors in general. You're gonna run into these three problems, I would guess. So unless you have a solution around those, I would be pretty cautious and maybe just try to bootstrap something together. At least you'll know how it works. Uh, yes. So I, I agree with you, and I think you made a, a key point there of hiring contractors in an area you didn't have an expertise in. Do you think at the time you, you may have been benefited by hiring contractors to do work that you did have expertise in while like, you guys worked on building something like that? That's, that's possible. Just looking at the three problems that we had, we would still have to scope it. We wouldn't know if they were doing a good job. And we could probably build on top of it. So I mean, you solved two of the three issues. We haven't done that. And yeah, I, I don't know. It might be, there might be a situation where using a contractor makes a lot of sense. But we just said that even if we had the perfect contractor and spent three times as much money on it, I think we would have been in the same situation as far as building something we don't know about. It might be different for a more established company or where you've got resources. Hiring things out in general, we try to hire a couple things out, like videos and different things like that. My experience is contracting something out, regardless of what it is, is a way to get a better project product, but not necessarily a get it faster. You know, you have to still put the amount of resources into scoping out a video and planning and working with them. And you might get a really high quality output, but you know, you're not gonna be able to iterate on it and different things like that. But you might get a really high quality output if you, if you do it right. But I don't think it's gonna be faster and you're not gonna save time. So that's just my experience, at least when you have very minimal resources. Um, yes? Do you think hiring someone full time would help in that case because you would have control over them compared to contractors? I'll, I'll get to this, this a little bit later. I think you want, you want your team. You know, hire a like make, find a co-founder, and I'll, I'll talk about you know, co-founder types of things and make sure I'm still doing okay on time. Yeah, we're doing fine. Uh, but I think you want all that on your team. You know, you don't want to lose that investment that you make on making this person useful, just to have them leave. You know, that's sort of a, a general thing. It takes a lot of work to make someone useful, and you just, under no circumstance, you want that expertise to leave your company. There wasn't much work being done, technically, so first I thought, okay, we're not getting much work done. We need more team members. So we went and got a bunch of team members, where we had five or six, and then I was spending all my time trying to organize these people to go and do something useful. So I thought, okay, well we have a big team now. Let's try and put together better organizational tools. Uh, I landed on Scrum. If anybody knows what Scrum is, you'll know that it, it's not a good idea when you're working 10 hours a week to spend half your time in Scrum meetings. So uh, we thought the better organizational tools would make more productivity, so that was also wrong. And then the third and probably worst thing I did is I thought, okay, well, I want to buffer my technical team from the founder experience, you know, talking to investors and customers and different things. I want to like buffer them from that experience so they can focus on technology. And that was a horrible mistake because that just takes all the fun and beautiful things about doing a startup. That's why most people do startups, is so they can feel like they're important and part of the process and you know, close to the customers. That's why our current employees say they work for us when you ask them, they were asked why they work for us. It's because they want to be part of it. So it was a horrible idea to distract and sort of insulate them from that experience that makes us so fun. So uh, these are the things that I really messed up when we were in school, working full time. Uh, 
Another thing that we also messed up was utilization of advisors. Our advisor agreements were two years, and the company changes so dramatically over the course of two years that I think that's just a horribly long time to sign an agreement for everyone, uh, to do an advisor agreement, just in retrospect. You know, uh, we also found ourselves when we had these longer agreements that we had it scheduled for every two weeks, and if we didn't have anything to talk about, we would just go and meet with them because we had it scheduled. And then I had to spend an hour coming up with stuff to talk about. And then we would kind of talk about some stuff that didn't really matter for another hour. And we ended up just wasting a huge amount of time for no reason. So it should have just called off the meeting. And it just felt awkward to do that. And now I cancel meetings all the time. Uh, and another problem kind of tied in with the advisor agreements were too long is we got the right advisors at the wrong time. So we have, I have an advisor named Steven, who's the CEO of a, a company in the same space, and when we were just getting started, I brought him on as an advisor, and there wasn't really anything for him to help us with, because it was sort of outside of his experience. But then recently, you know, a year later, now we're hiring people and you know, coming up with sales strategies and different things like that. He is the most useful person I have ever met in my entire life. So, when you have these long agreements, you can't really sit down and evaluate, is this the person I need? So in retrospect, and for all future agreements, we're going to keep it at six months and come up with an agreement for this much equity over six months, and then we'll reevaluate. If this person is still super valuable, we can reevaluate in six months, and I don't have to go and be like, hey, um, you're not super valuable right now, so can we just sort of end this agreement? <laughs> Because even though our agreement says we can't do that, it's horribly awkward. And it's good to just have these checkpoints to reevaluate and it's planned, just so you don't have to have these awkward conversations. There's a good standard agreement called the FAST Agreement from the Founders Institute. And minus the two year uh, length, I think it's an amazing agreement. And it also gives you a framework for how much equity to give based on the stage of your company and uh, what the investor is doing. You know how much works. So I think that's a great framework. Minus it's it has a standard of two years. Two years is a really long time. You know, two years ago I was the dumbest person I've ever met. Uh, now, yeah, slightly better. Um, another thing, interns. When you're really early stage and you don't have any money or you have just a little bit of money, your priorities change really quickly. And I don't know if it's the best thing to do to an intern necessarily. Um, some of them. Yeah, some of them love that, and that might be great, especially if they can turn into a, a founding team member afterwards. But I don't know if it's necessarily fair to just have them like spinning around in circles when they're trying to learn. They might be built like that, but I don't know. Uh, they're also pretty resource intensive to get useful, and they might leave you. <laughs> and then, uh, so unless you think this person is super great and will, you know, be a founder afterwards and come on full time or stay. It's just something to consider. There's great interns. We've gotten value out of interns. It's great. But it's just something to consider, you know, before you go and hire interns. It's just a, yeah, it's just a thought that, I'm sorry, there might be some interns out there. Um, <laughs> so these were the, the team mistakes I think we made. Anybody uh, disagree with me on anything or agree and want to share some lows? No? We all have perfect teams? Okay, so let's say that I have an idea, right, and I'm starting to develop it, right? So when I'm getting people, should I hire them or should I make them a part of the founding team? What would be a better option? So my thought process. If I have the money, if I already have the money. If you can hire them at market rate, hire them, right? Don't worry about it. If you don't, if you aren't really in a position to hire, then they should be a founder. It's, and if money is not the issue. If money is not the issue, you can hire. That you just pay them market rate or close to market rate for the stock options. You know, that, that's fine. But say if you don't have resources, I don't know if anybody really belongs on the team unless they're a founder or some special situation. If I could go back and if it was just, you know, me and Anshul took this super seriously from the beginning, if we, it could have just stayed me and Anshul and we just went to hackathons, you know, every weekend for a couple hours, I think we would have gotten tons of stuff done and it would have been very focused and, you know, once you get to that basic product market fit or whatever you need to fundraise, 
And then you can bring people on and you can pay them to make up for you know, the lack of you know, common, common sense that it requires to be a founder. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it might be sort of controversial, but it's, it's worth thinking about. You know, uh, you know it's, it's better to have two people that are 100% in than five or six that are between 25 and 75%. So that's, uh, that's just my experience, and yeah, a good, a good co-founder is worth their weight, and, you know, whatever is more valuable than gold, like black matter or something. Um, when you're pitching your ideas to, like, uh, for funding or like to gather a team, like, like what is the steal? Um, honestly, if someone steals my idea, like, I'm curious to see how they do it. Um, I think ideas are a dime a dozen, and there's not, you know, I, I, I feel pretty comfortable if I were to just go and present like my idea. And maybe even if it, if it got a hold of my code base, I don't think you could recreate DeepWalk. Um, your company is more than DeepWalk, it's the experience, or it's more than your code base, it's more than your idea. It's the relationships you've built with your customers, it's the experience you've learned from customer discovery, and you can go and do different things. I just don't feel overly protected. There might be, if you have a secret sauce that someone can just plug into a machine and spit out, you know, something that's 50x better, maybe worry about stealing your idea, but I just, like, I'll stand up here and give a presentation of how deep block works and, like, have at it. <laughs> uh, I'd be curious to see how it goes uh, because, you know, deep block is in our code base. At all. And our code base was pretty bad until it carries on. So that's that's my thought on it. And I think it would actually go for a lot of companies, and that's why I think there's less value in software uh, patents and different things like that, because you know there could be 50 apps on the App Store relatively soon. You're more than we're not an app. Uh, you know we're a lot more than that. Even though you can download us on the App Store, go give us a review. Um, yeah. So that's how I feel about ideas. I might be wrong, who knows? Uh, yeah, uh, so one of the things, yeah, um, I think that uh, I can relate some, some of the problems, uh, uh, difficulties that you encountered. So we also have all these uh, uh, problems. But uh, uh, and, yeah, and there is the challenge how to, for everyone to be more productive, and have fun, but at the same time, do whatever everybody would. So what uh, what uh, now? What we are uh, doing is is just to have a very uh, 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 a roadmap, a map. So we have all the tasks that uh, for whatever we need to do with a specific uh, dates and time when they need to be done, and who is responsible for everything. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter when they do it as much as these deadlines or yep. things are done. So uh, because sometimes we are very busy and we run with this, mm -hmm. and then you know we lose track. That's uh, uh, so it's like uh, somebody giving me this uh, this uh, <coughs> issue. It's like uh, if you if you have a, a map orienting so with your compass and map, mm -hmm. you have to go from this point to this point. Yep. And I said that uh, you have to do it in certain time. But if you start uh, running because, I don't know, I, you are a good runner, but you run really fast, but you don't look at the map, yep. then you will be lost. So that is the thing that we are Wrestling trying to with. put together yeah. and uh, see to have a, a very detailed map. So everybody has a compass and they, every, yep. every week we look at the map and see how, where we are. Yeah. So. Uh, he was talking about having a roadmap and sort of building in, in the steps to get to that roadmap. Yeah, I mean, that, whatever works for your team. This, the thing that actually ended up working really well when we were working just part time as students was we just had a Google Doc and we sat down and we decided oh, what are the two or three things that actually need to get done? And then we wrote those down and we broke them down a little bit and then we just put our names next to those subtasks, and then we would just sit there and work on them and just kind of work through that Google Doc. And way, way more effective than Scrum. If you're familiar with Scrum, there's like 50 meetings a week and you do nothing. So uh, 
it was, I think keeping it simple when you're, you know, just a couple people doing hack on the weekend is pretty great. Uh, just a checklist was quite amazing. Um, I'm going to speed through these last ones because I don't really know where I am on time. But pitching mistakes, uh, up until this last fundraise, we always pitched, hey, we're a sidewalk company and we're going to go into all this other stuff. And in every single pitch, it seemed like that other stuff was just something we tacked on to the end. Uh, and honestly, we did just kind of pack it on to the end, so we felt like we were a VC fundable company. Recently, we completely rethought how we do and view our company, where we are an automated infrastructure management company, and we're starting with sidewalks. And that kind of went to the pitch, and it aligns really well with the VC thoughts, because we're trying to be a big VC fundable company. Because, hey, if we automate the several hundred billion dollars in infrastructure <laughs> investments made across the world. And you know, we have this technology and we're starting with sidewalks because there's a bunch of legal regulation and it allows us to move really quickly. And it's just a way more effective pitch. So that might be anecdotal, but I think it's generally a stronger way to pitch a company. We're engineers. I love giving a detailed technical pitch that no one cares about. And I still struggle with this. After I look at my pitch from this last fundraise, it was unnecessarily complicated. I could have just given that, that two sentence pitch that I just said, but hey, we're a big company, you automate, you know, construction and infrastructure. We have some machine learning stuff and we're starting sidewalks. Like, we could have given a very simple pitch and I think it would have been way more effective than all the unnecessary nonsense, the details that we talked about. And then uh, we only practice our pitch, pitch competition style and when you're giving it over Zoom to one person, it feels really weird. It feels really weird. So I wish I would have practiced uh, giving a casual pitch where you walk through your company and they interrupt you and talk about it because it just feels super weird whenever you give a competition style pitch to one person over Zoom. It's just the weirdest feeling ever and they want to interrupt you and it just throws off your flow and it feels sort of disingenuous. I think there's a time and place for it, but it was super weird. Uh, so in the future, I'm going to be practicing casual pitching, where you just tell the story of your company with the slides, and they can interrupt me constantly, and it wouldn't matter because I'm just talking about my company that exists. So uh, that's my pitching mistakes. And this is my last slide. There's some fun stuff on here. Um, when we were, especially when we were first getting started, when we didn't know the answer to something, we tried to just answer with as much buzzwords and jargon as possible, and we never answered the question, ever. Um, it was quite amazing how we could never answer the question. And then when we, that didn't work, we always answer a different question that we didn't know the answer to, <laughs> for no reason. And you see it in pitch competitions all the time. And it, honestly, if you can't answer the question in two sentences, uh, I don't know, my crutch was, well, it's complicated. No, it's not, you don't know the answer. So if you can't answer in two questions, or two sentences, you actually don't know the answer. And it's a way better, more mature way to say it, and they'll want to work with you when you say, I don't know. How do you think we figured that out? Or talk about it that way. It's a way of building trust, and it's just way more efficient. Because I, I like, it's really annoying <laughs> whenever you ask someone a question and they just don't answer it and they answer a different question. Uh, we're really bad at investor updates. I'm still really bad at investor updates, but I'm getting better. Um, do them. They provide a little heartbeat to your company and give you a little bit of accountability on your goals. And even if your goals are changing, you have to change them and have them in order to have investor updates. So even though I hate doing them, I'm really trying to do them better because it does provide a little bit of a heartbeat to your company. And then uh, probably the most absurd mistake I made uh, or have in this presentation was uh, last week we met our investor in, in person for the first time. And he came over for a couple hours and we're in Chicago. Uh, super nice guy. And we just talked about the company for a couple hours. And then uh, it was on a Friday. And then this Monday, he shoots me an email. And uh, there's a couple sentences about the things we talked about. I'm like, okay, that's great. And then uh, there was two or three paragraphs on the fact that I use the word like <laughs> so much in kind of conversation. <laughs> and I thought it was absurd that I use like so often in casual conversation. And uh, he mentioned that on a scale of ChatGPT to the cast of Jersey Shore, you have zero being ChatGPT, 10 being Jersey Shore. I'm at a nine. <laughs> and he is so right. 
<laughs> we tried to make a scoreboard of the amount of likes that we use in casual sentence. And in the process of making the scoreboard, I said like at least six times. So um, you young and older people in the audience, try to audit yourself on how often you use like. I found myself just replacing it with ums, and as long as the likes are out, I'll work on the ums later. So that's my founding or my my parting advice. Try to do a like audit, and uh, you, it sucks all the fun out of the conversation because you can't talk about it. So uh, yeah, those are those are all the mistakes I made. Or not even all the mistakes. That's a small fraction of the mistakes I made, but the ones that I think were most relevant. Uh, I'll be hanging around for the next hour. I don't know how we are on time, but I can also stand up here and just answer questions or just hang out. So uh, yeah, thanks for coming. I hope you uh, you know at least miss one of these mistakes because I told you about it. Uh, and don't use the word like. Uh, thank you. <laughs>